Hello, I'm Zeno Kova, and in this talk we're going to discuss Bluetooth printing, which is Bluetooth tooth printing. Now you probably know what Bluetooth is, but what's tooth printing? Well, that's the identification of characteristics about the thousands of Bluetooth devices that are broadcasting around us all the time and figuring out how can we know what kind of device that is. So the brief about me is that the majority of my time is spent working on Open Security Training 2, a nonprofit I started. We make free classes, which are free as in beer, free as in freedom. They are actually open source so that other people can pick them up and adapt them if they'd like. But this talk is what I do with a minority of my time. 25% of my time I do consulting and research for Dark Mentor, and it's also just kind of a Trojan horse to get me into conferences to tell people about open security training. Now, if you've seen my past talks, bear with me for a couple of slides, because I'm going to repeat that the point of this research is that I want to know what Bluetooth chip is inside any given device. So let's say we have some random devices like a Tesla, an iPhone, an S-cam, and some random door lock. I want to know which particular Bluetooth silicon is inside each of those devices. And why would I want to know this? Well, I want to know if it's vulnerable to a firmware level over the air exploit. So Texas Instruments, for instance, back in 2018, had a vulnerability found by Armis. They found that they could exploit Texas Instrument chips over the air. In 2019, researchers at CIMU Labs and the TU Darmstadt University in Germany, they found that they could exploit Broadcom chips over the air. And in 2020, my wife, Veronica Kova, found a different exploit for Texas Instruments, and above and beyond that, she found an exploit for Silicon Labs, and she presented those at Black Hat 2020. But so the natural outcome of her research was, okay, great, you've got a couple of exploitable vulnerabilities. Where are the Texas Instrument chips used? Where are the Silicon Labs chips used? And the short answer was, we don't know. So that's why we didn't make a big hairy deal about it like some VC firms might, because basically we didn't want to overstate the impact. But that necessarily raised a question of, okay, as continuing research, how can we even figure out where these chips are used? If you just ask the vendors, they may not tell you and they may not even know because they'll sell their chips to a bunch of people and they don't exactly know where they all go. So the reality in this research is what I actually want to know is whether or not a device that I see broadcasting over the air is running some old and vulnerable buggy versions of firmware. And it's just the chip can get me closer to knowing that information, and frequently I can't just get this directly. So there's going to be many types of tooth prints which are going to be discussed in this talk, and version print is what I really want, and chip print is frequently what I can get to. So just like there can be many versions of firmware for a given chip, there can be many different chips for a given chip maker. So the chip maker print would tell me, is this, for instance, Texas Instruments, Broadcom, Silicon Labs, NXP, etc. And so it can be the case that amongst those different chips, different shared code could exist, which would mean that the vulnerability would exist across chips, but then perhaps maybe, you know, chip 1 and 3 have the vulnerability, but chip 2, 4, 6, 8, they don't have the vulnerability. So shared code means there will be vulnerabilities across multiple chips. Indeed, for Veronica's previous research, there were multiple chips which were affected from a given chip maker. But there are many chip makers, and so, for instance, there's more than 20 different silicon makers. So if you can determine a chip maker print, then again, it gets you closer to finding the vulnerability. You don't need to just throw proof of concept exploits for determination at every single chip out there, you only down select it to the things that you know could actually be vulnerable. Now at this point I need to introduce the notion of a module maker. So in the Bluetooth ecosystem there are module makers which use many different chips and this all propagates up like that. So concretely for instance a chip maker might be Realtek. Realtek sells their chips to a company like AI Thinker Technology, and this is a module maker. AI Thinker Technology then sells multiple modules. And so this is just an example from their website where you can see that there's, you know, this model, BW12, BW15, BW16, and each of these uses a Realtek chip, but it's ultimately a different module. AI Thinker could use multiple chips from multiple makers, but ultimately they're just going to sell a bunch of modules. And we don't know exactly where those modules go, what products do they go into. But we would want to be able to know, if I see that this is specifically module BW12 from AI Thinker, then I know that it's a real tech chip. 
So coming at this question of what is something running from the opposite side, there are many product makers, people who make actual Bluetooth products. At the time these slides were originally written, it was 3,330, but it's definitely much more by the time you watch this. For any given product maker, they may have multiple products, and each of those products could have a specific chip that's associated with it, or it could have a specific module that's associated with it, which of course naturally has a associated chip. So basically the point is that there's almost always a one-to-one -one relationship between products and chips, and we need to actually discover that relationship. So for instance, product one may use chip maker one, we may use chip one, and then we know that it's within the range of possible things that have exploitable vulnerabilities, or we may find out that product two uses module maker one but they use chip n and so on so we have to discover these sort of relationships just to introduce even more complexity there are of course many different modules for each of these module makers so we may additionally find a relationship like okay module maker one only ever uses chip one chip three a and x and so if we can say something about which module is running we know that module 11 is using chip one and module 13 is using chip maker one chip three so again determining these sort of relationships allows us to down select from the space of all bluetooth chips from all silicon makers in the world and just have some sort of subset that can get us closer to a determination of whether it could potentially be vulnerable to over-the-air exploits so the overall summary of all these various types of tooth prints is that what I really want and what I need is version information, and what I'm mostly going to get is chip maker information, module information, module makers, or product information. So I have to somehow, you know, work my way from mostly this information and get as close to the version printing as I can, at which point final assessment can always be done by something like a proof of concept exploit. So my terminology for this talk is that BTC does not mean Bitcoin, it's going to mean Bluetooth Classic. BLE is going to mean Bluetooth Low Energy, and BD Adder is a Bluetooth device address. So let's say you just happen to collect millions and millions of data points about Bluetooth, would any of that actually be useful to find a version print? Well, I started collecting Bluetooth as a hobby project during the pandemic just as a way to get out of the house and drive around. I have a talk about that, which is called It Was Harder to Sniff Bluetooth Through My Mask During the Pandemic, and that was presented in summer of 2023. Now, the majority of all of that data was HCI logs from Linux, HCI being the host controller interface, which is a Bluetooth layer that interfaces between a host, like a Linux operating system, and the controller, which is the Bluetooth chip. So I had many of these logs for many years, but I didn't get around to starting to actually look at it until May of 2023 after I completed my Vulnerabilities 1001 class for Open Security Training. And when I started looking at my data, I recognized that, okay, there's some stuff I can determine from the HCI logs, but there's a lot of stuff I can't. So I need to start doing some customized tooth printing in order to figure out other things that I wanted to know. So just as a quick overview of what the data looked like, I had 75 million Bluetooth classic addresses, like unique things, but that only adds up to 1% of my overall Bluetooth data. Of the Bluetooth classic, 99%, of that 20,000, or sorry, 204,000 were public BD adders, and we'll talk about what the different types are later. 2.7 million random static, 5.2 random resolvable, 307 random non-resolvable. So we'll talk about all those subtypes in a second here. So again, as a reminder, what do I want to know? What chip is inside a device and why do I want to know it if, to see if it's vulnerable to firmware level exploits? So here's what I want to know, the version information, and here's some various other information that may be related to each other. So for instance, you could have knowledge of an individual device by, for instance, knowing an individual device's address that may not change, and that's great. The individual device knowledge may or may not give you some information about the device type. The device type may tell you something about the model. The model may tell you something about the manufacturer, and the manufacturer may tell you something about the Bluetooth chip, which of course gets us closer to that firmware version we want. So just looking at some past work and what it had shown, fortunately I've got this super low resolution thing from uh, very old talks. So circa 2003 was the first thing that was trying to give a nicer visualization for Bluetooth information. And basically it just said, here's the current discoverable Bluetooth classic devices in the area. And all I want to say about this is that within this UI, it had information about device type, 
and it had information about manufacturer. You can see here it's saying something about Cisco. So different past work has covered different elements of these kind of information. And then, for instance, there's been different things in the past that have talked about fingerprints, but fingerprinting as a generic term can mean very different things to different people, and often it depends on what their actual threat model is. So if you're interested in, for instance, tracking an individual device over time, so more of a tracking and privacy threat model, then you might want to focus on an individual device and you want to get a fingerprint for an individual device. I don't want that. I want the firmware version information. But here you can see some past work where they said like, okay, based on the clock skew over time, we can see that, you know, a particular device's clock skews at a particular rate and therefore we can pluck out individual devices from other background noise. But again, that's not what I'm interested in. So at this point, I'll put a quick plug in here for the Bluetooth timeline. So on our website, darkmentor.com, bt.html, I have created a tiddly wiki, as I've done in the past for firmware level vulnerabilities on PCs. And this one is focused on all the Bluetooth security research over the last 20 years. The thing I like about tiddlywikis and the reason why I decided to reuse it is because it makes it very easy to semantically tag everything. So there's a whole bunch of tags on every single research saying who made the research, where are they from, like which organization, which conference were things presented at, where was the attack surface, like what layer of Bluetooth was the attack surface, which tools did they use. I need to add more about which tools they used over time. I didn't have that as one of my original criteria, but I'll add it more. And then you can just do generic searching for keywords. Words. So if you search for fingerprint, you can see some of the past work on fingerprinting. I'll cover some, but not all of those in this talk. So again, what past work, generally speaking, on fingerprinting has given us is individual device fingerprinting, device type, model, manufacturer. But what I really want is firmware version and or Bluetooth chip to get me closer to firmware version. So basically, past work didn't really quite get me to what I wanted. For the most part, with some exceptions we'll mention later. Okay, so now let's talk about the different approaches you can take to tooth printing. The first one is what I would call a purely passive approach. In this one, you just set up a sniffer and you let devices broadcast wireless information and you just capture whatever they broadcast and nothing more and that's all the information you have to go off of. This is great from a stealth perspective because you literally never send any packets so no one's going to know you're there and doing it. The second approach is what I call mostly passive and here you're doing the same sort of things that occur naturally when you ask an operating system what Bluetooth devices are currently visible. Because when you ask an OS that, it's going to do some natural requesting of information saying, hey, who's there, capturing anyone who's broadcasting anything otherwise. But basically, this is sending packets that are in no way anomalous. You send only those packets which are natural operating system generated things. And if someone, you know, wanted to try to say like, oh, I want to see that there's some bad guy here who's trying to get information about me. Well, this is just all the same information that anyone going to their phone's Bluetooth preference pane would see the same information would generate the same sort of traffic. So this is non-anomalous data. And that's why I contrast the mostly passive to the active. In active, you intentionally send any sort of weird packet that you want, and you explicitly query every little bit of information you could ever get from a device. This will definitely be anomalous and suspicious if anyone ever starts looking, but in the meantime, it's a great way to get more information. And a lot of what we're talking about today is going to fall into this bucket. So let's start with a first simple tooth print based on the BD adder, that's the Bluetooth device address. OUI, Organizationally Unique Identifier. Now, I want to quick throw up some Bluetooth stack diagrams so that we can start to organize. We're going to be, you know, bopping around the layers of these stack diagrams, and we need to keep track of, like, where are we right now? And additionally, everything I'm talking to you today does not cover every single protocol here. So there's obvious things where f further work is needed. So BD Adder OUI, this will be found in BD Adders in the link layer of Bluetooth Low Energy and in the link manager protocol of Bluetooth Classic. These two layers basically correspond to each other, but they are completely different protocols between Bluetooth Low Energy and Bluetooth Classic. It's only some higher level layers like L2CAP, the logical link control and adaptation layer protocol, which are shared between these two different things. So anyways, BD Adder is the pretty simple case. Because you have a Bluetooth Classic, Bluetooth device address, BD Adder, and in the context of Classic, it's a 48-bit address which looks exactly like the MAC addresses that you know and love from Ethernet. 
and it's exactly alike in the same sense that the upper bits are an organizationally unique identifier assigned by the IEEE. So typically that is 24 bits, so it is half of the address, the upper 24 bits of 48 bits, and sometimes it can be lesser granularities like 20 bits or 12 bits. If you're interested in the privacy sort of threat model, which I'm not in this particular talk, it is worth knowing that these Bluetooth Classic BD adders never ever change. So they are 100% unique and these are mechanisms by which people can be tracked. So for instance, the upper 24 bits may look like this and you might be able to look that up in the IEEE database and say 001FFF is Responix Inc. Then looking at Bluetooth low energy BD adders, first I'm gonna do a quick hand wave to say that there's a bit in the headers that says whether a device is public or random. So first we consider the public addresses. These look exactly the same as Bluetooth classic addresses. You've got, let's say 24 bits of the 48 bits and it's never ever gonna change. So if a Bluetooth low energy device is using a public address, it is 100% trackable and you can associate which company makes it potentially. On the other hand, if the bit for randomness is set, then we have three other types of addresses. There's what's called a random static address. Here, the most significant two bits are set to one, and then the rest of it is just some 46-bit value that the company randomly assigns. The key thing here is that you lose out now. There's no semantic information about which company has assigned this address. So while this is still static and unchanging and could be used in a tracking scenario, it does not give us any information about the company making the particular device. Then furthermore, there is the BLE random instead of random static, it's random private. The random private addresses are designated into two forms, resolvable and non-resolvable. Start with the non-resolvable, the most significant two bits are zero, and then it's all just 46 random bits after that. And the key thing about these random private addresses is that these are intended to be cycled over time. So they just, you know, pick 46 random bits, they use it for 15 minutes, then they change the 46 random bits, then they change it again and again and again. And so that makes it so that that tracking threat is no longer as much of a problem. Of course, as we just saw, there were things like clock skew and stuff like that, and there's other physical layer ways, ways of fingerprinting but the general principle is that as long as these addresses change they're not as trivially trackable as public addresses or the bluetooth classic addresses and then there's the ble random private resolvable and the difference between this is just whereas this is all random this is 22 bits of random and then a hash of something that can be used between two devices to identify oh yeah i can see that you have you know for instance the same key as me but we don't really care about that aspect for the purpose of this talk. And because this is the extended Kova cut version of this talk, I don't have to hand wave. I can tell you that right here, there are bits in the BLE advertisement, PDUs, portable data units. And these are the bits that actually say whether or not a device is public or random. And this is the transmit address is public or random. This is the receive address is public or random. So those are baked into a 16 bit header in the advertisements. Okay, so if we're trying to do some sort of a tooth print based on BD adders, what we really want are those BD adders that included a IEEE OUI. And that was, again, the Bluetooth Classic and the Bluetooth Low Energy Public. So we can see, again, Classic is a tiny subset of this data, and Public is this small sliver of the 99%. So the ultimate math on that comes down to that, in my particular data, only about 3.2% of the overall BD adders, which is these two things divided by the overall totals, are actually something with an OUI. But let's talk about what the OUIs show us and how those can be interesting. If we look at Bluetooth Classic specifically, and I know the top 20 out of 604 companies that were seen at the time of making the slides, we can see a whole bunch of companies, Garmin, Samsung, OnePlus, Actions, Apple, and I've got a few little emoji keywords to say these are things with phone associations, car associations, audio, but this is what we really want to focus on throughout the rest of the talk, chip-related things. If you see a chocolate chip cookie, that means that something has to do with a chip maker, and remember, what I really want to know is which chip a device is running. So this is chip maker information, and this is module maker information. So going down the line, we have places like Samsung, which does occasionally make their own chips, but for the most part, they use Qualcomm, Broadcom, MediaTek, and sometimes their own chips. 
Whereas something like Action Semiconductor, this is specifically a chip maker. And so if we see a BD adder, so this is just a device address for some particular product, but the particular product is saying, hey, by the way, my IEEE OUI is Action Semiconductor, that highly suggests that the company chose not to reset the BD adder to something for their own company. Maybe they don't actually have an IEEE OUI, or maybe they were just lazy. But basically, it is a very strong indication that if we see a silicon maker in the OUI, that probably means that it's using the same silicon for its Bluetooth chip. And then for companies like this, Panasonic Automotive Systems, Laird, Connectivity, Pioneer, these are things that are frequently used in cars. This is Bluetooth Classic, so this is often just the audio system for the car. And again, if we know something about the module maker, then we can actually figure out what subset of chips Panasonic ever uses, what subset of chips Laird ever uses. So anyways, this is just kind of a quick overview of this data. And you can see I've listed here some of the different chips that different makers use. I will say that this data is definitely skewed towards car type stuff because I like to set up my Bluetooth sniffers over overpasses of interstate highways in the United States. And that means I get a whole bunch of cars driving underneath and I collect their data. I like the data to come to me. So just take that skew into mind throughout the rest of the talk. Okay, and then just looking at the Bluetooth low energy, well, we see the top thing here is actually Texas Instruments, and then we've got things like Silicon Labs. Oh, hey, those are the two things that Veronica's exploits were for. And then we've got things like Expressive, T-Link, and various Chinese companies as well. So again, the hypothesis is that if a company has a advertisement of my BD adder is from Texas Instruments, they probably were just lazy and didn't change it out, and it's probably running a Texas Instruments piece of silicon. So this is the first traces of what I really want to know. It is the fact that if a BD adder maps to a chip maker, that gives you a strong indication with high probability that that particular device, which is advertising something right now, that particular device probably uses that particular chip. Sometimes you'll get something that maps to a module maker, but again, module makers, we can figure out what set of chips they actually use. But we have to collect that sort of data over time and just by scraping their website. So back to what I want, I really want the firmware version, but what I have here is something like a BD adder. Looking at the OUI from the beginning, I can do an IEEE OUI database lookup, and that might give me something like a manufacturer. And then I'm going to make an assumption that if we have a particular OUI print being a silicon vendor, then that is going to be the same thing for an actual chip print. You'll see an example later where this isn't true, but it seems to hold most of the time. Now let's move on to tooth printing by link layer version information. This can either be mostly passive or active. So this is link layer stuff over here in Bluetooth Low Energy and LMP stuff in Bluetooth Classic. So Bluetooth Classic has link management protocol and Bluetooth Low Energy has link layer protocol. And these have control packets and they are sent to request information about the other Bluetooth device. And I want to be clear, these are such low level packets that you may think of Bluetooth in the typical user UI sense of like, well, two Bluetooth devices are asked to connect to each other and then it maybe asks you for like a pin code. All these lower level packets are handled and processed behind the scenes before you ever get to anything like pairing or bonding, which has to do with association between devices. So we're specifically going to be looking at two packet types, the LL version indication in BLE and the LMP version response in Bluetooth Classic. So unfortunately, the Bluetooth spec is pretty terrible, and therefore the spec definition of what is in an LMP version response is it tells you, yeah, it has a versioner, a comp ID, and a subversioner. So they don't even tell you like how big these things are or anything like that. It tells you like, well, you send a LMP version rec and you get back an LMP version res. But yeah, the, the spec is not great. Now, thankfully for Bluetooth Classic, things have been improved in the Bluetooth low energy spec. And so here for this thing, the LL version indication, this gives us the same versioner, the version number, the company ID and the subversion number. And now it actually tells us one octet, two octets, two octets. So one byte, two bytes, two bytes. So when you read the spec, these things seem very interesting from a tooth printing perspective. But someone else thought that was interesting too, and so I got scooped a little bit. So back in May of 2023, Care at Alt 
found in their Woot paper that they thought it would be super useful to be able to use something like an LL version indication in the context of Bluetooth Low Energy to get useful information for BLE stack fingerprinting. Now the thing is this was just barely mentioned in the paper, one single slide, one tiny little paragraph, but they assumed that, well, this seems like this will work, so yeah, we're going to just quick and say that's going to be a thing and that's going to be useful for finding whether or not something is exploitable. And they didn't really do any sort of data analysis or proof of why this is useful, but I've got lots of data, so let's look at some data. Starting with an example based on this specific MediaTek for the company ID, BLE version or version number of 5.2 and subversion number of 0. So if I look for my data under MediaTek, which is a company ID of 70, we see that actually the most common ver subversion number is actually 0. So 0 over there in the context of Bluetooth Classic, 0 over here in the context of Bluetooth Low Energy. So they're all MediaTek stuff, but if you ask what's the subversion number, well, 0 is definitely the largest contributor. So this kind of suggests that zero may not be a great fingerprinting value because it's probably something more like a default value that vendors may not set. Now there are other values and those are less frequent and those seem like they might be more useful. But the thing is, for instance, you know, let's, if you were trying to use this to fingerprint something and you went with a subversion number of zero, well, that thing you're fingerprinting might be some knockoff iPad, the OnePlus pad. It might be some bike share bike locks that I saw at a security conference over in Italy. It could be a Nokia phone or it could be a telematics unit. So by itself, it's not necessarily giving you the precision you may need to actually ex execute an exploit. So anyways, drilling back down into like what are the components of these things that are shared between Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy, the version number is actually just a number telling you what version of the Bluetooth specification that it conforms to. Now this number in and of itself can actually be interesting from a vulnerability assessment perspective because there can be things where you know that people didn't go back and fix protocol level bugs in earlier versions of the spec. Maybe some protocol level bug came out and was fixed in the future, but everything running an older version will be vulnerable forever. Unless the particular vendor decided to make an individualized change. Looking at the company ID, I said that there are 3,330 defined at the time of original writing, and so this is just a big list of all sorts of companies that have signed up with the Bluetooth SIG to have their own ID. And at the time that I made this slide originally, the top entry was Princess Cruise Lines, and I was like, that's weird. Why does Princess Cruise Lines need a Bluetooth ID? I only found out later when I was looking to take a summer cruise about this particular device. This is a Princess Cruise medallion. It kind of looks like an AirTag type device. And here's an internal photo from the FCC database. And if you look at the marketing information on their website, they talk about, well, hands full, no problem. Walk along the corridor and voila, your door unlocks as you approach. So we can reasonably infer from this that it is using Bluetooth proximity or signal strength in order to say, hey, I'm close enough to the door, go ahead and unlock the door. The problem with using things like Bluetooth proximity signal strength, also known as RSSI, received signal strength indicator, is that back at hardware.io in 2022, Sultan Khan showed a talk where he showed how he could attack things like Teslas, which used Bluetooth proximity, or various Bluetooth low energy locks. And he showed basically how you can proxy the low level communications and just proxy between, you know, this lady is somewhere else on the boat, and then you go stand next to her, you send it via some other wireless thing, and then someone walks up to her door, and this door talks to the other person, the other person's thing proxies over a wireless link to the person standing next to the victim, and then the two devices very far away can do whatever Bluetooth communications they need, and the person standing next to this door will have enough signal strength that the door will be tricked into believing that the person is actually standing there. So proximity is definitely not the kind of thing you want to use for authentication purposes. So Tesla, in response to Sultan Khan's presentations, basically said, yep, that's a known limitation. We just accept the risk. Although personally, I think that they ultimately tightened up the expected round trip time for those communications because I certainly noticed that my Tesla Model 3 uh, phone unlock of my car doesn't work as well as it used to. Anyways, that's a little bit of a tangent. Let's get back to this information from the LL version indication PDU. So it turns out this is an extremely good 
thing for figuring out what silicon a device is making. Because if we just look at the actual data, almost every single piece of data we ever see from packets of this type has the company ID set to a silicon vendor. So if you can get a device to respond with this response to this LL version indication packet, then you will have a high probability indication of what silicon it's using. But then you have the question of how often do they actually respond? In my data right now, I only had 11,000 out of 92,000 devices or 12% actually respond to my link level indication. Now one, this is data that I only started collecting very late in the game, like mentioned before, I didn't even start thinking about this until May 2023. Two, this does not take received signal strength indication into account. So basically, I'm just flinging off like, please tell me your version number, please tell me your version number, and I may be sending it to a device that's too far away that they can't hear me, or they may hear me, but they may not have enough signal power to actually send it back to me and have it be received. So what I really want to figure out in future research is what percentage of the time do devices actually respond to these sort of indications under best case signal strength conditions. Here's the overall data for that, just out of your own curiosity. And then on the Bluetooth Classic side, where we have instead the LMP packets, again, it seems to be that we have a high signal to noise ratio and that most everything seems to be chip makers. Now, there are some things where I can actually say, I'm pretty sure that is like actually a bit flip. So the reason I can tell you that is I go and I look at more data and I say, okay, here's my company ID information. It's mostly chip makers. Then I look at something like this and that's that G wearables. Why, why do we have something called G wearables? That's not a silicon maker. Well, it turns out this particular device with that exact BD adder, we can see two more instances of it down here. And down here, it's called Zhuahai Technology Company based on its company ID. And so down here, it seems like, you know, this particular thing, the version number, it was eight up here and it's three or eight down here. And we've got, you know, potential bit flips it would take three bit flips to get you from an eight to a three. And then down here, we've got, this is where it was Zhuahai and up here it was G wearable. So that seems like that was a single bit flip to change from a 1D6 to 5D6. So anyways, I'm pretty sure that this field, generally speaking, will always be silicon makers as well, other than whatever corrupt data you get. And then finally, there's the subversion number, and the Bluetooth vendor gets to make up whatever they want here. The spec specifically says that the subversion number field shall contain a unique value for each implementation or revision of an implementation of the Bluetooth controller. Now, when I first read this as a firmware person, Talking about different numbers for different revisions for the Bluetooth controller, to me, that felt like, oh, well, yeah, that's going to be like a firmware version number, and that's going to be awesome. So that's why I went after this particular field. But of course, when the Bluetooth silicon makers read this, they probably are thinking that Bluetooth controller refers to the silicon rather than the firmware. And what's our sort of data for that? So my hypothesis was that I think that this is going to have, you know, the subversion number is going to have incrementing firmware versions. And so I can just do a firmware update and I'll see the version increment. This is categorically rejected for vendors like Broadcom. And why is that? Well, if we look in some open source things like BlueZ, that's the Linux Bluetooth stack, we can see things in this packet.c that are essentially IDs for different Broadcom chips. So this BCM43142 A0, that is one particular Broadcom chip. You can have things like A1 or A2, and those are essentially saying there are revisions of the Broadcom chips. So I had seen this just sort of accidentally, and then I remembered that internal blue, which is the TU Darmstadt tool for sending arbitrary Bluetooth packets and attacking Broadcom things, they had firmware files that were essentially per Broadcom chip. And so I went and I went back and looked at this, and these firmware files had names like 6109, which exactly corresponded to the Broadcom USB version table over in the BlueZ stack. And so we can reasonably infer that Broadcom is reusing these sort of IDs between USB and Bluetooth, and that an individual ID, this 16-bit value, corresponds exactly to one particular chip and one particular silicon revision at that. So at least for the Broadcom, the subversion number indicates specifically which silicon it's running and the stepping revision. That's basically the perfect world chip print. So that's great. I would have preferred a version print, of course, but that gets us extremely precise information about which silicon it's running, at least. So again, what I want is version numbers. What I mostly get is stuff like chip makers, like, oh, this is Texas Instruments. Oh, this is Silicon Labs. 
But this particular case, I did get a very precise chip print. That's this particular chip at this exact silicon revision. So that's pretty cool. Now for other vendors, basically more information is needed. So for MediaTek, for instance, we saw that subversion number was very commonly zero, but there were also a bunch of different versions that looked like they took on unique values, but whether or not those are actually uh, different versions of firmware versus silicon, the only way you can find out is go off, put hands on a device, and then do a firmware update, see whether version numbers are actually changing in the subversion field. So that requires additional investigation, which I haven't done yet. And more broadly, this applies in that we need to put hands on things in order to actually determine whether or not the subversion number field is being used for firmware or silicon stepping. Now let's talk about tooth printing by Linklayer packet combinations. And this is definitely active tooth printing. So Linklayer here means the literal link layer at BLE and the LMP layer at Bluetooth Classic. Now, if you think of what we're trying to do here with Bluetooth printing, vaguely as similar to Nmap OS fingerprinting, you may know that Nmap used a bunch of different packet types in different combinations, different orders, different bits that are not supposed to be set being set. And by seeing how different operating systems reacted to those weird packets, you could make a differentiation between operating systems. So here we want to differentiate between different silicon so we can send all sorts of different packet types and see how they react. Now, these are just the ones that I currently have support for sending. There's a whole bunch more types, but these seemed like the easy, obvious ones that would provide us with useful information. Things like feature requests, feature request extended, name requests, version information, that's what we just talked about, and so on. So for instance, malformed feature request. Let's look at that. Now how feature request is supposed to work is that you can say LMP feature request extended to from one side to the other side, and then you'll get back a LMP features response extended. How these feature request packets work is that they're basically a big bit mask of a bunch of different features that the device says it supports. But once you get down to bit 63 of this bit mask, it'll tell you if bit 63 is set, then that means there are extended features available and you'll have to send different requests to get those. So the basic features are on page zero, these first 64 bits, and the extended features are on page one and two, but they don't actually have all 64 bits defined. These are again, just extensions to allow for supporting more different types of features. So again, the documentation for the Bluetooth Classic is pretty terrible. And the LMP features request extended says, okay, the fields of that particular packet are features page, max supported page, and extended features. And it doesn't say what their sizes are. But if you read the description, it says the LMP features request extended PDU, that's this thing, contains a features page index that's that thing, which specifies which page is requested and the contents of that page for the requesting device. So basically at the time that you're asking about the other side's features, you're also opportunistically telling them, and hey, by the way, here are my features. Pages are numbered from zero to 255 with page zero corresponding to the normal features mask. So basically this features page thing is saying, you know, which feature page you want to get information about and what your actual information is. Now, you should never request a feature page greater than their max supported page or the max page of the version of the spec that they conform to. So for instance, spec version 4.2 only has features page 0, 1, and 2. So what happens if you send a features request for page 255? Well, that depends. They're supposed to just ignore it, and so some things when you send an invalid features page will send back a rejection notice. Other things will handle it, but they'll send you back all zeros. And some things I've seen actually seem to be sending back garbled data, perhaps leaked information. On these devices, it suggests that when you go past the valid features pages, all of a sudden you start leaking 64 bits at a time from related memory areas. So these are the kind of interesting device specific behaviors that we want to tease out in order to use these various low level packets to determine what kind of silicon is running on the remote side. The fact that the LL and LMP packets require no sort of pairing, no sort of authentication makes these things perfect for doing this kind of tooth printing. Now, when it comes to actually sending these packets, I'm personally using Sventooth and Bracktooth. These came out in 2020 and 2022 respectively, and Sventooth only does BLE and Bracktooth only does Bluetooth Classic. 
Sventooth uses Python to control some code that talks with a Nordic dongle, and Bracktooth uses C to control some code that talks with a expressive dongle. And so although there are other tools that can send arbitrary packets, I definitely found these to be the easiest to work with. So what does my data about weird packets say? Well, the short answer is I don't know, or at least I don't know rigorously. So the original whole point of tooth printing was to send these weird packet combinations and to see how different things behave. But I haven't actually deeply analyzed this data yet. Why not? Well, the answer is because I don't feel like I've found the right balance between speed and a useful signal. So I have a whole bunch of data and, you know, it says lots of interesting things, but some of the data is very slow to get back. And I don't feel that that would actually be useful and practical, and practicality is definitely one of the things I'm focusing on, if I send a whole bunch of different types of packets, but it takes like five minutes to send that. So that's okay when you're testing on your own device, but if you're just driving past a device on the freeway, which is kind of my hardest use case and the case that I want to make happen, that is not going to be valid. So like it says, I'm targeting moving devices and I want things to work. Now it turns out that Bracktooth and Sventooth each add about five seconds of overhead to every tooth printing attempt. So long term, probably going to have to move off of those as the actual packet sending infrastructure. Similarly long term, going to have to move to raw sniffing to see the responses coming back. But for now, while this serves as a useful proof of concept, and that's why I've, you know, released the code that has all of this, it's not really where I want to get to. And so I'm sort of prioritizing getting to a place where I can get the data the way I want before I actually analyze the data. Above and beyond this, it does make sense in this context to have reference chips that you're going to compare data to. So for instance, I should have, you know, one TI, one Espressif, one Silicon Labs, one Cypress, one Apple, one Samsung. I should have a whole bunch of different chips and I should collect the known good values for all of these various weird tooth print things because that will give me the starting point to know that, okay, well, I can't tell the difference between a Samsung chip and an Apple chip, so I need better tooth printing mechanisms in the first place. And because I haven't collected that reference set yet, uh, essentially analyzing the data is a little bit premature. Okay, let's talk about tooth printing by manufacturer specific data. This can be passive or mostly passive. And here the layers targeted are again link layer and now EIR, extended inquiry response. This is not the same thing as LMP, I just tacked it onto this diagram. It's a particular type of packet that comes back when you're asking which Bluetooth classic devices are in the area, they may send you back an extended inquiry response and it could contain this manufacturer specific data. So in the documentation, it talks about manufacturer specific data is optional for EIR advertisements and other types. And the thing about this data is that it again is manufacturer specific so they can put whatever they want there. What they're supposed to put there is the first two bytes, the first UN16, is supposed to be the company ID, the assigned number from the Bluetooth SIG. It seems clear based on some of the garbage values I see sometimes that not everybody actually puts that there. They seem like they just start immediately out with the data. But most people put something valid there. But the reality is that even when they put stuff valid there, they don't have consistency in terms of what endianness is used. So sometimes they use the company ID Big Indian and sometimes Little Indian, and I see some vendors like Samsung and Apple who actually use both. Now I was really wondering why the spec didn't actually say what Indianness is used, and it turns out I had to go digging around. It turns out back when they created Bluetooth spec 4.2, and they created they created an extension called the Core Specification Supplement document, and that essentially is the point at which they lost this information. So the Bluetooth spec 4.0 specifically said that all numerical multibyte entities with values associated with the following data shall use Little Andean. So they're supposed to be using Little Andean, but if you look at any spec from 4.2 onward, which is definitely the most common baseline used out in the wild, if they looked at that documentation, they wouldn't actually be told the right way to do it, and consequently people do it wrong. So looking at the top 20 Bluetooth Classic MSD data, and just going down the line, we can see that we do seem to have a decent number of silicon makers. Chip makers, so we've got Apple, which they can be a silicon maker sometimes, most of the time they're using Broadcom, but if they have their own devices like AirPods that use their own wireless chips, then they are their own silicon maker. But in this particular case, that is them doing it wrong Indian, and in this is the correct Indianness. Their ID is 4C, and it's, so it should be 004C. Samsung is a weird one in that they have their own IDs, but sometimes they use FF19 for no particular reason, but other times they do the correct Indianness 
Indianness or the incorrect Indianness. Looking at Bluetooth Low Energy, this is actually a whole lot less devices that are actually silicon vendors. So consequently, what this tells you is that in Bluetooth Low Energy, which is definitely the most common place where you're going to see manufacturer specific data, most frequently, this is going to be the particular company making the particular device, someone like Garmin. Garmin doesn't make their own silicon. Walt Disney does not make their own silicon, as far as I know. But Bluetooth Low Energy seems like the development kits make it more amenable for the developers to plug in their own IDs rather than use the one from the chip maker. And if you see the fact that Apple is by and far the maximum number of things, and you can actually see this, 9 million is saying that there's more of these packets that I've seen than all of those BD adders that I talked about. Well, that's because Apple has a particular type of manufacturer-specific data called iBeacons, which other people who are not Apple can be using. So for instance, a Tesla will beaconing off particular packet types, and if you looked only at the manufacturer-specific data, it would say it's Apple, but in reality it's Tesla, in reality it's a iBeacon type packet. So again, sometimes you have to take this data with a grain of salt. Like this does not have as high of signal to noise ratio as those LL version indications and things we talked about before. Now let's talk about GET. And this can be active, but there is some information that is advertised that directly pertains to GET, which can essentially be passive or semi-passive. But that's just kind of uh, nitpicking here. So anyways, GET is here in BLE. It can technically be used in Bluetooth Classic as well as a newer sort of extension, but that is far less frequent. And personally, I haven't even been attempting to do GET connections on Bluetooth Classic. I will in the future, but for now, I just kept it to the place that I know it's primarily used, which is Bluetooth Low Energy. So what is GET? GET is the generic attribute profile, which is a thing that runs on top of the attribute protocol. So attribute protocol is the actual reading and writing mechanism, and then this profile is a thing on top of that. Like I said, mostly used in BLE, technically can be used in BTC, but much less common. Now, the interesting thing about GET, and the reason why we've actually seen some past work on this, is that it theoretically can give you everything you would be interested in. It can tell you it's an individual device. It can tell you a device type, the model, the manufacturer, the Bluetooth chip, and the firmware version. So is GAT the ultimate tooth printing mechanism? Let's find out. First, just to show you an example of what this kind of information looks like, if you ever open up one of those Bluetooth scanning apps on your phone, something like Light Blue or Blue Fruit Connect, you will see Bluetooth devices, you click into them, you try to get information about them, and you might see something like this. This one is taken from Blue Fruit Connect. So what kind of information do we have here? We have a serial number. Well, serial number is probably individual device unique information. And so if I was just wanting to track whatever this is, maybe I would just run around doing get information queries and seeing if I ever see this serial number again. Additionally, we have model number. Well, that's the model information, great. We have manufacturer name, Zebra Technologies. So whatever they make, we know what model it is. We can look up Zebra Technologies ZD621. And we can find out exactly what it is. We also see things that are literally called firmware revision. Well, that's exactly what I want to know. And also a software revision, so we don't know exactly what the correspondence is. What's the firmware? What's the software in the context of this device? We don't know exactly, but we really like the fact that we can see firmware revision. And if we then go and search for what this device is, ta-da, it's a Zebra portable printer. So this is basically like a receipt printer, essentially. I was, uh, it's called Instacart One. I was just in a grocery store and I saw it and I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. So great, that is like a best case of what GAT can potentially give us. What we normally see with GAT is a whole bunch of nothing, as you can see here. What does 0AF6 mean to us? What does 0AF7 mean to us? These mean nothing to us, at least initially. So some particular device with some weird obscure name, we don't know what it is based on its name. We don't know what it is based on this information because that's not useful. So basically devices frequently can decide not to respond to GAT information or they may respond with information that's not useful to us in the first place. Additionally, it can take a whole lot of time to actually get this information and we'll drill down on that in a second. But if you're curious what this ID 205L is, based on Googling, I'm assuming that this is this little Apple watch knockoff type thing. $30, such a deal. So there has been some past work specifically about using GET for fingerprinting, but what did they actually mean by the fingerprint in this context? What they meant was literally just every single piece of information that it sends back, that's the fingerprint. And so we can reasonably assume that their threat model was talking about privacy. They basically want to say everything about this 
tells me one individual device and let's think about whether or not that person can be tracked. And indeed, that's what it says right here. It's about the privacy of the owner. Now, the particular things that I thought was interesting is it talks about device type, device model, device manufacturer, and user's name potentially being described in the GAD information. But my threat model of privacy says that, you know what's really a threat to privacy? getting arbitrary code execution over the air. So I would include things like the firmware revision as interesting information that they didn't include. Now looking at their data, they have this nice little table that tells us GAT is slow. Essentially they're saying some devices like the smart light bulb can take 6.5 seconds, other things 1.4, but an average of 3.6 seconds across various devices. I personally have seen things take up to 24 seconds to reply to my GAT printing inquiries. So GET is super slow. Is GET the ultimate tooth print mechanism? Well, I said that my personal use case is I really want to be able to tooth print devices as I drive by them on a freeway. So things taking three seconds, that is just a straight up no-go. Things taking one second is probably a no-go. Like how long are you going to be in range of a device going the opposite direction on the freeway? Not that long. So that's again why I gravitate personally towards those link layer packets instead of higher level things. Another little bit of information that was interesting here is that out of all the data, they saw 13,000 devices that responded with a device name. And specifically what they're saying here is if the device said like, hey, I've got a device name, 99% of the time it would actually return the data for the device name. On the other hand, they have the firmware revision string, which you can see only 835 devices. So if it said it had it, it did respond 95% of the time, but most things didn't even say they had it in the first place. Now, part of the reason for this is probably just the fact that their data is skewed towards iPhones. So they said they had uh, 9,924 iPhones, and indeed iPhones include device name, but iPhones do not include firmware revision string. So I'm not faulting them for that because my data is heavily skewed towards iPhones too, as you'll see later on. But if only 835 out of thousands, you know, tens of thousands of devices actually have a firmware revision string and only 95% of those actually report it, is GAT printing the ultimate tooth printing mechanism? Maybe not, right? It's saying that a lot of devices are not even going to just straight up tell you the firmware revision information via GAT. Now, there's some other interesting work from 2019 that also focused on GAT for fingerprinting, but here the fingerprint was different than the previous work and different from other things. So basically here, they essentially had what is more like a device model fingerprint. They were not specifically looking for individual device fingerprints like the previous one because they weren't focused on a privacy threat model. So essentially what they did was they did semi-active fingerprinting and they just collected whatever sort of UUIDs, universally unique identifier, 128-bit things that are available through GET. They collected the top level information and they called that the fingerprint. Now, if you don't drill down, if you're not active like the previous paper and you don't actually request the name of the device, request the firmware revision of the device, then of course you're not going to get to a individual device fingerprint. At best, you can see, well, this looks like it behaves like an iPhone, not just Zeno's iPhone. Now, the one thing that I'm very skeptical about from this paper is that they said specifically that they didn't connect to the devices and request GAT information for ethical reasons. I super don't buy that. There's nothing unethical about just collecting GAT information. I think this really had more to do with what Ohio State University would allow them to do. Anyways, the most interesting thing about this paper was not the fact that they just scanned the least possible information out of GET. What was interesting is that they did a bunch of static analysis of Android applications and extracted these GET UUID 128s in order to figure out this particular device that I see beaconing these UUID 128s, what is it associated with? And based on Android applications, you can generally assume that, you know, there's a pairing of, you know, if you've got a Bluetooth vacuum cleaner or something, there's a Bluetooth vacuum cleaner app. If you've got a Bluetooth camera, there's a Bluetooth camera app. And so by extracting UUIDs from Android applications, they could say, okay, well, this app corresponds to this company and maybe they can identify, you know, how, which particular type of device it's associated with. And now you can get a lot more interesting semantic information from otherwise uninteresting, frequently randomized UUID 128s. So just as an FYI, how I do get printing in the Bluetooth printing code that I released, it's just using the get tool that is part of the Bluezy Linux co code. 
it is deprecated and so it's not compiled by default. So you have to first enable it and compile it. And then also its output is not exactly machine parsable for throwing in the database. So I had to make some tweaks to the uh, output log file format so that we could throw it in the database. Now, part of the reason I went with GAT tool, even though it's deprecated, even though it's a little bit of a rigmarole, is that if you try to use things like the high level Bluetooth APIs as exposed in BlueZ and the way they want you to do it these days or the way that Python does it when connecting to the way they want you to do it, essentially you run into a problem where every time you try to just get the GAT information, it'll try to pair to the device instead. And that's because pairing frequently, like some GAT information can only be requested if you're actually paired. Otherwise, it'll be rejected. But just getting the highest level information does not require pairing at all. And therefore, GAT tool will just go right through, get me the information as a baseline. And anything that, you know, it couldn't get, it would just say, you know, error out. But this was much better than using some other stuff where I couldn't even get the information unless I paired. And of course, most people, if they see some pairing prompt randomly, maybe they'll click OK. But uh, hopefully some people don't. And, and really, at the end of the day, it's not actually necessary anyways. So let's talk a little bit about some of those UUID 128s. And specifically, let's go back to what I actually care about, which is not just it looks like an iPhone, which is not just I can track that particular person's iPhone. I want to know which silicon it's running, which chips are the devices running, which vulnerable firmwares are they running. So it turns out that there is a little bit of this GAT UUID 128 type information that is useful for answering my question. So it turns out that some silicon makers have these GAT services. You can just think of them like some application. Uh, you can just think of them like some interface that's connected to over Bluetooth. They have these GAT services and they are associated with unique UUID 128s and they specifically are for firmware update of this particular vendor's chips. So for instance, Texas Instrument, OTA, that's over the air, firmware updater has a GAT service UUID 128 of this. There's a whole bunch of other sub things that are associated with characteristics. So if you ever see any of these as well, same thing, you can infer they come back to Texas Instruments. Now, this is interesting because specifically Bleeding Bit, that is the first over the air exploit I told you about from Armis in 2018 for Texas Instrument. They did have a general arbitrary code execution vulnerability via buffer overflow, typical bug of that sort. But they also pointed out that Aruba had put a customized sort of security through obscurity uh, interface in front of this otherwise vulnerable Texas Instruments firmware update interface. And basically, if you did some magic unlock code to the device, then it would open this up and just let you update the firmware. So their second major finding of Bleeding Bit was essentially, hey, these Aruba things, if you just get around the security through obscurity, you can just flash arbitrary code onto the chip. And that is obviously a whole lot easier than pulling off an over-the-air exploit. So the fact that Texas Instruments had this architecturally vulnerable firmware update mechanism was a bit of a problem, but it's a bit of a problem that's shared by all sorts of other silicon vendors. So Nordic, for instance, has these IDs that are associated with a UART GAT service. So this is the uh, universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. So that's like a serial port type thing. So these magic numbers tell you, hey, it's got a Nordic serial port thing. And thus far, I haven't seen anyone else reusing Nordic serial port that I don't have other reasons to believe is Nordic. But down on the firmware space, they have what they call the legacy device firmware update uh, GAT service. So just these magic numbers means that it's legacy firmware update, really insecure firmware update. And then they have a newer secure firmware update service if you see this particular thing. So literally, if you just run around and you see this number coming back for GAT information, you can know, hey, this is a device that's probably using a Nordic chip and you don't even need to bother with an exploit because you can probably just connect to this interface and reflash the firmware. Another chip maker, Cambridge Silicon Radio, bought by Qualcomm, but CSR, very common in automotive space. And they have a thing called Gaia, which is their over-the-air update protocol. So again, magic number means there's a firmware update interface. And it strongly indicates to us, the presence of this particular number means it's running Cambridge Silicon Radio. And one more just for good measure, Silicon Labs has this thing called BGX Express Streaming. This is streaming arbitrary data via this GAT service. So this is not a firmware update thing. But for instance, I got tipped off to this when I saw a talk about someone looking at a particular EV charger and they were saying, oh, it uses this BGX Express thing. And that's specific to Silicon Lab chips. Now, even actually down at the module maker level, like Laird, 
we can see things like serial port usage. So Nordic had its UART, Layered has its virtual serial port. And again, this magic number, this magic UUID 128, gives you a strong indication that the device is a layered device. And then from there, we once again have to map back to, okay, well, what particular chips does Layered use? And that at least gets us to a subset of all possible chips in the world. So again, how do we get to what we want? Well, as close as we get with this is some magic number. Look it up in a UUID print database, and that can tell us, well, that magic number is associated with Nordic, and we can have a strong inference that the device probably uses a Nordic silicon. Now, just to throw it up on the slide so you can check it out later at your leisure, here's my top 20 GAT services in my data. And you will see that these are essentially going to be skewed towards Apple. So we have, you know, it advertising the availability of GAT, advertising the availability of GAP, which we're not going to talk about. And then device information, this is the common one that gives you that baseline stuff like name and firmware version and time and stuff like that. But then there's things like Apple Nearby, Apple Continuity, Apple Media Service, Apple Notification. So obviously the presence of those tells you that this is at least made by Apple. And you can see there's a precipitous drop off in my data between the Apple things and then the next most popular, the Bose things, and then some Amazon things, and then some Google things. So again, my data is skewed just like the other researchers in that Basically, Apple devices are some of the more chatty devices via GAT. So those were the services. Those are the higher level things. These are the characteristics. These are nested underneath the services. And that's where that device name and appearance and battery level and current time, those are the things that are nested under this device information service. So here's my top ones. Again, high bias towards Apple. And check it out at your own pace later on. So the previous sections was stuff that I generally covered in conference talks prior to this, but I've expanded upon a little bit. Now everything you see from this point is essentially stuff that I didn't have time to talk about in conferences. So let's talk about tooth printing by name. This can be passive or it can be mostly passive. Now, the name information can be sent back at the link layer in BLE or the extended inquiry response in Bluetooth Classic. So what the name print information usually gets us is something like a model print. And so essentially, if the thing just says straight up, I'm an Ember ceramic mug, well, you know that it is an Ember ceramic mug. It says it's an S-Cam, it's a Versa, a user's MacBook Pro. And of course, Apple devices, they will default to whatever the user's first name is when they create their account. So if I say my name is Zeno Kova, by default, the device will say Zeno's MacBook Pro unless I go out of my way to change it. Now, the reason this can be passive or mostly passive is at least in the context of BLE, devices can frequently be sending these advertisement indication packets. So they're just blowing those up all the time, sending out this information. And so sometimes the name will actually Actually be a component of the advertisement indication. Other times they may be advertising, but then you have to send a scan request and then they'll send back a scan response. And that is where you will actually see the name information. So basically passive or semi-passive. But again, semi-passive is the type of thing that just happens naturally behind the scenes if the operating system, you know, opens up the Bluetooth preferences and tries to show the user what devices are around. It's going to go off and send some scan requests naturally to show the user meaningful human readable names. Now, there's a whole lot of different behaviors when it comes to names and name prints and BD adders and stuff like that. So first of all, we can consider one device, one unique name, and one unique BD adder. So we could have examples like this, where the BD adder is actually included in the name. And so that can matter for, you know, OUI printing. So here we have Aura, that's like a smart ring. We've got the no key, that's like a smart lock. And you can see that exactly this thing right here is the BD adder. In other cases, you can have partial inclusion. Here we have a Galaxy Fit that includes a partial inclusion. That's the lower 16 bits. And the same thing for the Xiaomi Smart Band. And then you can also have presumed serial number inclusion. So it's sort of a unique name, but it's not unique because of the inclusion of the BD adder, but instead something that's presumed to be a serial number. And you can go watch my past talk of why I believe that strongly that these are serial numbers for these particular devices. This is a police body cam, and this is a heavy construction equipment from Caterpillar. And then there's the occasional weird thing that I see, like this Galaxy Watch Active, where We've already seen that Samsung has a convention of including the least significant 16 bits of a BD adder for uniqueness, but in this case, it doesn't actually correspond because they've got a random static address. So in this case, I think that they might be leaking something about the actual non-random address that was original to the hardware, but I don't know. That's just kind of an interesting observation. 
Now, we can also have one device that has one unique name and many BD adders. This happens when we have those random resolvable, random non-resolvable things that just cycle periodically over time. So the unique name in this case is LE Sam's Bose Speaker. Well, we got a pretty good idea that that's a Bose speaker, and we've seen multiple BD adders over time, but the whole point of that random resolvable and stuff was to make things like not trackable and stuff like that. And something is definitely trackable if it has a unique name like this. So the non-trackability at the BD adder level can definitely be undercut by higher level protocols, other semantic information like the name of the device. Then we have cases like this where you have a single name and multiple devices share the single name. It's a common name. There's nothing unique about the name. And then each device, there's a one-to-one -one mapping of device, has the name, and then it has a unique static address. So nothing changing ever. So Tesla key fobs, for instance, you have a device and it'll have a static address. It'll never, ever change. On the other hand, you can have devices like the NVIDIA Shield where one device, like multiple devices, have the same name, just Shield, but that device is also using random addresses that change over time. So device one will always call itself shield, but sometimes it'll have this address and then it'll have the next address and it'll just keep cycling over time. So there's all sorts of different associations between, you know, which devices have which names and which BD adders. Now, when it comes to creating name prints, I essentially wrote 1,447 regexes, regular expressions, which I'm calling the name prints. And I essentially, you know, I just looked through my data a bunch and I said, okay, what is that? I Googled it. And like, this is again, the type of thing that I did over like three years, just whenever I felt like it, I'd go look in and see if there was some interesting new name. I'd Google anything that sounded interesting. And then I'd write down a regex saying, okay, I think this is that device. So looking at my Bluetooth classic data, over these 1447 regexes, 557 name prints out of the 1447 matched on Bluetooth classic data. And so my total Bluetooth classic data was 65,000 things. There were 65,700 unique name and BD adder pairs. So there's more actual pairs than there are BD adders. And that has to do with like corruption of the names and stuff like that. So one BD adder getting multiple names, which in the context of uh, Bluetooth classic should never ever happen. Basically, these things do not generally change their names. So different names for a single BD adder is almost always just corruption. And that led to 23,000 name print matches over these 65,000. And so that essentially breaks down to 36% of all my Bluetooth classic data. I was able to successfully identify what kind of device this is based on just this collection of name prints. But if we look at all of my possible data, then what we're actually looking at is that Bluetooth classic is only 1% of my data. Out of that 1% of the data, 90% has a name. Out of that 90%, then 64% didn't match. So essentially we come down with 36% of 490% of 1%. So it's only 0.3% of all of my data is Bluetooth Classic with a name that matches a name print. So that's not great, but of course that's out of a total of 1%. So it's again, you know, close to 30% of the Bluetooth data. If you're curious what some of the top matches were, well, I have things like Garmin Diesel, and these are basically GPS for truck drivers. Again, I said my data is skewed towards things you'll see on a freeway because I have my sniffers set up over a freeway. So Volkswagen in-vehicle Bluetooth, Apple iPhones, signage. These are, you know, Samsung, uh, big screen TVs that are used for signs at businesses and so forth. So you can uh, check that out later. All right, coming back and looking at the name print data for Bluetooth Low Energy. Again, 1444 regexes, 912 of those fired on some of my BLE data. And then just jumping all the way down here, 39% of the name data is actually matching a name. So again, looking at it, you know, out of all my data, BLE is 99%. Out of that 99%, 98% had no name. So only 2% had a name. And I think that's an important takeaway. Sometimes people think like the only Bluetooth stuff out there is the stuff they see beaconing with name. No, there's tons of stuff that never ever is going to tell you a name, but which is still out there banging away all the time. And then out of that 2% named stuff, only 39% matched. So overall, over my total data set, this is still 7%, which, which I still think is pretty decent in that just by writing these regexes, I can tell with high confidence what, you know, 7% of the devices are out there that I see. Not just 7% of the name devices, but 7% of all Bluetooth devices. And if you're curious what kind of stuff we see at the top hitters of BLE, we've got Tesla devices, we've got GPS devices for truckers again, Samsung, Disney theme park stuff. So again, you can go back to my previous thing. Just because I ran around with a sniffer at Disney, I have my data skewed towards Disney data, for instance. 
So check that out later if you're interested. Now, very, very rarely, as in I've only ever seen it once, a name print can actually give you a chip print. So this is my regex, the FIO BTR5, and that I know runs a Cambridge Silicon Radio 8675. How do I know that? Well, I went to their site and they made a big hairy deal about it by putting this giant picture of the chip on their website. They thought that was a super important thing to advertise and I said, thanks. Cause I was just, you know, Googling what is this FIO thing and this is what I came up with. Now the different tooth prints can actually start working together to help you identify devices. So I'm gonna say OUI prints beget name prints. So for instance, I see a bunch of names like this. Like I said, for, you know, a couple of years, I just see stuff and I'd say, okay, well, I don't know what that is. I'll just Google, you know, MCX201 Bluetooth and maybe something come up, maybe something wouldn't. But when you combine this with things like the OUI prints, which tell you a company name like Teltonica, then now you can say, what's an MCX201 by Teltonica? And, you know, you can find stuff like this, the MCX201. But then, you know, you have other things where you just can't tell at all. Now, at least for the MCX201, that can get you something like this. And once you have a picture like this, you can actually get an FCC ID, which we'll talk about later. That can actually help you figure out exactly what the silicon is as well. So that's kind of interesting. But what I want to point out here is just that, you know, you start looking up things. You go to a website, you find a thing like this, FM, FMM. 0, 0, A. You go to that website, you see a bunch of different model numbers on their website, so FMM00A. You then do something like using the Wiggle data set, and you say, okay, I think I saw a device called FMM00A, but is that the pattern? Is that like a common recurring pattern? You look at Wiggle, you put in a regular expression there, FMM00A, and percent sign to say basically wildcard the rest of it. And you can see, indeed, I see all sorts of different devices across the world that are called FMM00A. So that tells you that is probably a good pattern for this vendor that it starts with the model number. And you can, you know, go and try to confirm that. So you look at another model number like FMM003, you look at the Wiggle data set and you say, yes, this definitely seems to be a recurring pattern. So that is frequently how I would use Wiggle to determine whether or not my name prints were actually any good because I can see a whole bunch of other data from all across the world that I never saw myself. So here concretely is like an example of what some of those name prints look like. So, you know, a little bit about what it is. It's a telematics tracker based on the naming convention from this website. And then here is the actual regular expression. It's this model number. It is the character zero to nine, seven times, and then end. So character zero to nine, seven times, and then end. But literally, as I'm looking at this right now, I can say, oh, well, what about that thing? There's something that's not zero to nine. So clearly my name print is not sufficient in that case. And I may need to go search for other name prints. And, you know, I could use Wiggle to quickly determine whether, you know, DTM is the starting point or or if those are just some random characters. Another tooth print type is device ID profile. And this is mostly passive. This is found in the EIR of BTC. And so some things include this in their extended inquiry response. It's called device identification profile, but I can't actually see anything in the spec that says it's supposed to be here in the AIR. And indeed the supplement to the Bluetooth core specification doesn't list it as valid. Regardless, we can see that it does actually exist and it does get used. So this is what the data structure looks like. So I'll show you the data structure in Wireshark in a second, but basically the thing to know is that the vendor ID source, so that's right there, if that is one, then the vendor ID is going to be looked up based on the Bluetooth assigned numbers. And if it's two down here in vendor ID source, instead the vendor ID should be looked up based on the USB assigned company IDs. So concretely, this is an example of like what that information looks like when parsed by uh, Wireshark. And so we can see here the vendor ID is Linux Foundation because it's 1D6B, but that is coming from the USB implementers forum. So basically whatever this device was, well, whatever it is, it's called SD7000T. This device said, okay, I'm going to set the source ID as being from USB IDs. And then the source ID was set to the Linux Foundation which is interesting because when you Google SD7000T Bluetooth device, you come up with this. Sync up drive connected by T-Mobile, the SD7000T1 user manual. This is actually like an ODB2 diagnostic port thing that connects via Bluetooth. You plug it into a car 
And then essentially, I believe the way it's supposed to be used is, is that I think this has cellular connectivity as well. And basically you can use it to track your car, but also you can connect to it from your phone. So the top 20 vendors from the Bluetooth Classic device ID data is this. So first of all, this first one is Stabilo International. And I looked that up and I was like, what is that? Why is that so common? Well, the answer is that this is not actually that, it is actually Samsung. Samsung went ahead and set their vendor source to Bluetooth, but then they used their USB ID. So the vendor source should have been set to two, not one. So a bug there on Samsung, uh, Samsung's case. So basically a bunch of Samsung things that do Bluetooth Classic will include this optional information. And if you just know they're doing it wrong, then you can at least get a quick indication that it's Samsung. Second most common is that Linux Foundation thing. And I don't exactly know why that is the case. I haven't looked into, you know, are these mostly PCs or something? I kind of doubt it, but I don't know. And then here you can see plenty of instances where there's, you know, null. The company name doesn't actually correspond to anything in either of those databases. Other instances where there's a few chip makers in here, but it's not super common. Now this may again be one of those things where it got lost in the specs over time, but from the Bluetooth 4 spec, it did actually say back then that additional EIR data types may be defined in profile specifications, and then there was essentially a profile specification for device IDs. Now let's talk about tooth printing by UUID 16 instead of UUID 128. This can be completely passive or mostly passive. This is mostly going to target the link layer, although you could argue that it's actually at the GAT layer as well. Over in Bluetooth Classic, this once again appears in the extended inquiry responses. So there are 16-bit IDs that can optionally be included in EIR or Bluetooth advertisement packets, and they're frequently used to advertise company-specific services rather than actually this being a device that is made by that company. So for instance, you can see over here that there's Google here, Google here, Google here, there's a whole bunch of Google instances. I can tell you, I don't remember which one it actually is, but one of these is a service of like fast pairing. And so when a device actually advertises one of these services, it's just saying, hey, we support the fast pairing that Google supports on their Android phones. So, you know, the device can actually do the fast pairing instead of normal pairing. Tile, for instance, you know, we know that mostly they make these tracker tag type devices, but Tile has partnerships with some uh, Bluetooth headphone makers, where essentially the headphone will advertise uh, that it has has support for this tile service and essentially you can track the headphones the same way that you can track a tile device or for instance amazon here if i remember correctly i believe that this one is the amazon thing for alexa and so essentially there's a whole bunch of devices that are not made by amazon but which support alexa and therefore they're going to advertise this 16-bit id so these UUIDs are very much more hit and miss in terms of whether they're advertising a service by a particular company as opposed to advertising that this device is made by that company. There are certainly some silicon vendors present, but they're not prevalent. So if we look through all the data, you know, these are some examples of CSR things and Nordic things and Qualcomm things, but you can see these are vastly dwarfed by these other types of services that are advertised. So this type of data doesn't give us the best signal to noise ratio for figuring out what we really want to know, which is what silicon is present. But sometimes it will give us the information. So for instance, we might know and look up based on this, that if we ever see this particular 16-bit UUID advertised, then we have a Cambridge Silicon Radio device. And we can infer that it's probably running Cambridge Silicon Radio chips. Now I want to return to the UUID 128s that we saw briefly in the context of GET, because GET is not the only thing that uses these. So that again can be passive or mostly passive, or it can also be active if it's in the context of GET. So these can be advertised, and in those cases, it's completely passive. You just have to listen for advertisements, or they could be something you have to inquire about via GET. I want to return to a couple of examples from previous talks quick before I go into a new example. So this is just kind of to show the kind of detective work that occurs when you're digging into this data and trying to make use of it. So for instance, in the past, I talked about how I was sniffing and running around in South Korea, and I found a device called KFTC Bank Paws. And this turns out to be that KFTC is the Korea Financial Telecommunications and Clearing Institute, which handles interbank, interbank payment systems in South Korea. So that's interesting. But what I saw in my data was, for instance, I either saw this or I saw this, this or this, this or this, this or this, this or this. So essentially what happened is sometimes if I would ask for more information about the device and get back a scan response packet, I would get a name like KFTC Bank Pause. 
But other times, if I didn't get a scan response back, this is all the information I have. And here, what we're actually seeing is manufacturer specific data. Talked about this briefly before. I said the first 16 bits are supposed to be a company ID, and here it's Apple. And now I can, you know, just make brief reference to this notion of iBeacons. We'll come back to the iBeacons in a little bit. But again, I said that Apple has a thing that other people who make non Apple devices like Tesla's or this bank point of sale system, they have a special data format for these iBeacons that is going to send the information out. And so just the presence of this 128-bit value within the overall raw manufacturer-specific data, like essentially you parse down this manufacturer-specific data by saying, okay, well, based on this, I can tell that it's an iBeacon. And now based on this, I'm going to, you know, from here, I'm going to parse out the uh, UUID 128. And then after that, I'm going to expect a major ID. That's right there. And I'm going to expect a minor ID. That's right there. And then something about the signal strength so I can determine how far away it is. And that's right there. So the these iBeacons were essentially used by Apple back in the sort of early days, early push of Bluetooth Low Energy. The idea was that iBeacons could be used for sort of indoor location finding and tracking so that, for instance, people could figure out where they are in a store or stores could figure out how frequently a particular or how long a person dwelled in a particular area of the store. So, but the point here is that this particular UUID should generally not be reused amongst other things. And therefore, even if I don't have this thing telling me that it's got a name of KFTC bank pause, I can say, if I see this UUID, I'm probably looking at a KFTC bank pause. So that's an example of where this UUID can be looked up and then tell me the device type. And in that case, that's about all we get out of it. That's all we get from the UUID 128, but we may have other things that tell us something like, oh, this uses this particular model module maker. Anyways, so moving on, another example I covered in a previous talk was talking about Fitbits and things like that. So there were a bunch of UUIDs that are associated with Fitbits, and by default, the Fitbits do not actually tell you the name. But you could see the UUID, and you could use that to walk backwards and know something about, is this a Fitbit Versa, or a Versa 2, or a Versa Lite, or an Ionic? But there's clearly sort of an overlap here of, it's not a one-to-one -one in terms of model information. So a UUID tells us something about a manufacturer Fitprint, Fitbit, but it can also tell us something about, you know, specific models or device type as an activity tracker. So those were some past things I covered in previous talks. I want to talk about a more interesting thing here. But then earlier in the talk, I told you what I really actually want are UUID 128s that give me something like silicon vendors, right? Okay, well, I obviously jumped ahead of myself here and I already kind of told you everything you need to know about iBeacons and that it contains this UUID 128. Now let's look at a more interesting case. So this particular thing, I was looking at it. And I said, okay, it's Milwaukee Tool. What is that? Well, for folks who don't know, Milwaukee is a brand of actual power tools. So I thought that's probably something like this. And then I see this other thing called BLE112. And I do a typical Google search for what is BLE112. I search down. The first result that I get is this thing. It's called the Tick Tool and Equipment Tracker by Milwaukee Tool. And this thing is essentially an air tag for tools. It's something you attach to your tools, and then it essentially can be tracked via Bluetooth Low Energy. I just wanted to mention this because, you know, there's a lot of visibility in the privacy space for, you know, A, air tags can be used for stocking, tiles can be used for stocking, and then consequently, you know, companies like Apple and Tile pushing back and saying, oh, we've got these mitigations for, you know, anti-stocking features. Look, there's other devices that have the exact same use case, and I guarantee you Milwaukee is not investing anywhere near the amount of money that Apple or Tile is in anti-stocking. So there's a whole bunch of other things like this out there and that once you start looking, you can see that all sorts of different companies, they don't make them for, you know, people for the normal user. They make them for like tracking logistics in a uh, shipping warehouse and stuff like that. But anyways, I just want to say, you know, even if Apple and Tile got to a perfect world, anti-stalking defense, there's still a ridiculous number of Bluetooth devices that could be used instead. Anyways, that's tangential. What's this BLE-112? All right, well, we search down a little ways and we get this thing, BLED-112 from Silicon Labs. That's not what we're looking for. Subtract that out, but yet we still get it as the first sponsored result. Anyways, go down and the first thing for BLE-112, once we subtract out the D, is the Silicon Labs BLE-112 datasheet. The datasheet looks like this, and this gives us a strong indication that that BLE-112 that was mentioned in the GET information for the Milwaukee tools is probably a particular Silicon Labs chip. So immediately below that result, 
there is information about getting started with the Blue Giga BLE112. So I'd heard the name Blue Giga before, didn't exactly know what it was. So, you know, BLE112 seems to be a Blue Giga module. Then going back to the data, we got a nice little uh, confirmation of that based on the OUI print and that it actually says it's a Blue Giga Technologies thing. So then I go off and search what's the relationship between Blue Giga and Silicon Labs, and I come up with this result that back in 2015, Silicon Labs acquired Blue Giga. So now I know that BLE112 is a Blue Giga device, and it will just might show up as Silicon Labs because they actually bought them. So get information, Google search tells me BLE112 is a Blue Giga module. Find out that Blue Giga equals Silicon Labs now. Notice amongst the other information returned by GAT that there's a serial number of 12345678 That's interesting to me because it seems kind of uninitialized, like perhaps the Milwaukee developers decided to just not do anything there when they might have. Looking at the manufacturer-specific data, we can actually see that it is Milwaukee ID as well, although they are using the big Indian form instead of the little Indian form. And then here's where I'm trying to get to the notion of there also is iBeacon data. So there's all sorts of information in here. The iBeacon data seems to have its major and minor ID not actually initialized. So just like the serial number, there's a whole lot of non-initialization going on, but there is also this UUID 128. And so a natural question for me is, is the UUID 128 anywhere else? Is it used by any other company, any other devices, and so forth? So I can use the tell me everything script to just search through and find all instances of it. And it turns out the only places I ever find it are associated with Silicon Labs, or associated with Blue Giga. So based on this, I have a very strong indication that this iBeacon UUID 128, not just an actual uh, GAT UUID 128, it's not for a GAT service, it's not for a GAT characteristic, it's for iBeacons. This seems to be highly associated with these Blue Giga modules, possibly basically just because it's uninitialized in some devices. And do I ever see this anywhere that it's not associated with these? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Therefore, high probability that this UUID 128 is indicative of Blue Giga and Silicon Lab chips. Now, it doesn't hurt that we had an OUI print that was corroborating the fact that this was associated with Blue Giga. But again, this is just trying to show you a little bit of the thought process, a little bit of the detective work and Google searches that it takes to find out that, you know, in a very roundabout way, that uh, a particular iBeacon UUID may be associated with silicon as opposed to associated with a particular iBeaconing device. And this is definitely why we need more crowdsourced data about this kind of thing. Now, there's a plot twist here, and that is the fact that the Blue Giga module was actually based on a TI chip. So in the documentation, it says BLE112 is based on TI's CC2540 chip. And that is not actually the TI chip that Veronica's exploits work on, but it is the one that the bleeding bit works on. So did the Armist folks say in their original advisory that, yes, this works on Aruba wireless devices and also Milwaukee tools? No, of course they didn't, because they didn't know, because no one knows, because we don't have the information today in order to do this sort of vulnerability assessment. So sometimes we have this kind of information where a UUID 128 lookup tells us that the manufacturer is Blue Giga, but the actual chip is Texas Instruments. But we're only generally going to see that kind of disparity when we know that the manufacturer is actually a module maker. Tooth printing by class of device is a mostly passive activity. So this is going to very rarely target the link layer, and most of the time it's going to be EIR packets. So mostly Bluetooth Classic has this, and class of device is a field that essentially is broken down and that you have major service classes, major device classes, and minor device classes. So for instance, the major device classes can tell you things like it's a computer, it's a phone, it's an audio video device. And then there's going to be minor device classes that tell you what kind of computer, what kind of phone, what kind of audio video device. And that would correspond to this device type information that we talked about before. Additionally, the major service class tells us things like it's doing audio, networking, rendering, where that could be printing or speakers capturing, which is scanners and cameras and things like that. Ultimately, way back in that 2003 Blue Sniff talk by Bruce Potter, this was the information that it was actually keying in on. It was displaying you something about the class of device uh, from Bluetooth Extended Inquiry Response Packets. Then we have an active fingerprinting method of tooth printing by SDP, which is the service discovery protocol unique to Bluetooth Classic. 
Now, there had been past work here in 2004, and they basically just queried things via service discovery protocol, and then they created a hash from selected data within the available protocols. I'm not sure exactly why they did that uh, instead of taking the entire data. I think it had to do with the idea that some of the data is naturally changing, but I don't know because I haven't actually analyzed my data yet. I just took the deprecated SDP tool, which is one of those Blue Z deprecated tools, just like Get tool, collected all the information, exported it via XML, but I haven't actually decided how to process the data yet. Because I'm more focused on the silicon fingerprinting and because I don't think this is necessarily going to have a high signal to noise ratio of what I want to know about, this is basically something I'm leaving for future work and for the research interns who work with me. But generically, the type of information SDP seems to give us is device type, model information, manufacturer information. So again, as with all those other places we've seen manufacturer information, some of that could correspond to Bluetooth chips, but I just haven't had a chance to drill into it yet. And the final tooth printing mechanism of this talk, loved by researchers the world around, is PIX or it didn't happen. So it's not scalable at all, but we can look up teardown pictures. So basically, if we want to know the chip print only for a very specific device, for instance, the target of security research, then we can just look online for teardown pictures. Some random person may have just torn it apart for fun. And if they haven't, regulatory authorities like the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in America, and other wireless regulatory authorities in other countries often have information available on their websites that vendors are required to submit for compliance. This can in turn, <clears throat> this can include things like internal photos, which are very useful. So going back to one of my previous talks, talked about Rivian, talked about how it had public trackable addresses, had OUIs that were Texas Instruments. So we had a high indication already that it was Texas Instrument chips. But when we looked up the information in the FCC database, this is just what I call the perfect chef kiss mwah, of the best sort of case of a picture in the FCC database that tells us exactly this is a Texas Instrument CC2642 chip. That's one of the boards from within the Rivian systems. I don't know which board. But this is the more common case. You may have something like this where you have obscured chips that you can't actually see any model identification numbers on them. And so in that case, you just have to either buy one of the devices yourself, tear it apart yourself, or you know, find someone else who did a teardown online. So let's put it all two together. What have we learned about in this talk? We've learned about name prints and UUID 128 prints and OUI prints and LL prints and GAT prints. And there's all sorts of different things that contribute to that toothy smile that is a tooth print, a Bluetooth tooth print. But putting aside the fact that wireless links are lossy and we may not always get every response for every data type, like we saw previously with the KFTC bank pass thing, even if it weren't for lossiness, every device is not going to have every service and therefore necessarily tooth prints will not have every single piece of data. But even the absence of this information can serve to give us this sort of unique tooth print. So all the various tooth print types that I talked to you today are currently capable of being collected via the tooth printing project at this particular link. Um, obviously, the part of the reason why I showed you all of those stack diagrams of all the Bluetooth classic and low energy stacks is because it's obvious that there's other areas that I haven't looked at yet, things like L2 cap. There are things we can do, but we need more people looking in this space and working in this space uh, in order to actually make some progress. So this is my starting point, uh, the most possible types of tooth printing that's available today. And I hope people will check it out and play around with it. In the future, I expect that we'll have open security training classes where I make it easier to work with the tooth printing stuff and learn about how to use it. So this is my call to action for this talk. Join me and together we will rule the Bluetooth galaxy because there's so much research left to be done. There's so many silicon vendors where no one has even taken a single look at them yet. And so I hope to make this easier through things like open security training classes in the future, but until then, I'm putting together a crew, a blue crew. Because basically right now, vulnerability assessment of Bluetooth is not a thing you can even really do. The majority of my time, again, is spent on open security training, and only 25% of my time is doing this kind of research. So putting together the crew in order to make it so that we have more people continuing to keep the ball rolling forward on this. But anytime you want to jump into a new area like this, the important thing is to read related work and not duplicate the effort of other folks. That's why I put together this timeline, the timeline that covers everything from the last 20 years 
years in reverse chronological order. I also have a talk that I gave at hack.lu where I talk about, you know, specifically the different waves of research that have occurred. The initial Bluetooth Classic wave that fell off and then the rise of Bluetooth Low Energy, the first wave and the second wave. So you can check that out as well if you want to see some of the most consequential talks from the most recent five years. But just in general, it's good to have a sense of what all has gone on in the space. Okay, well, that's my talk. And, you know, Bluetooth research is cool, but like I say, open security training is cooler. That's why I spend the majority of my time on that. We will have Bluetooth classes eventually. In fact, as of the time of this recording, I just finished my Architecture 1005 class on RISC-V assembly. That's going to have some relevance to future Bluetooth things because RISC-V is used in expressive chips. And I'm now going to start working with Veronica on the future Open Security Training Bluetooth class. But even if that's not ready at the time that you watch this, there's so much other stuff on Open Security Training about reverse engineering, vulnerabilities, firmware, system architecture. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can learn in preparation for the Bluetooth things. And if you already know stuff that we don't have classes on, we're always looking for new instructors. So if you've got the mad skills and you want to share them, you should reach out about making classes. And now, because this is the Kova cut, the extended stuff, I can cover a couple of backup things. So just miscellaneous thing about, you know, going forward with the Toothprint stuff, a big question is how should the Toothprint data actually be structured to be useful? Like, you know, is, should we go look at Nmap and see how they structured their data? Are there more efficient ways to do it? I don't know yet. Like I said, I'm very interested in what percentage of devices actually respond to these various protocols that we're pinging. But it's not good enough to just look at your data. You have to actually look at this more rigorously and take signal strength into account because only then will you know how often the reason they don't respond is because they choose to not respond. Maybe they reduce their attack surface versus you just have signal strength issues. I've got a PhD student from a local college that who's going to take a look at that and look at it more rigorously. But again, we need more rigor. Like I mentioned, there's all sorts of different packet types that haven't been looked at, L2CAP, RFCOM, all sorts of behaviors like beaconing frequency. We have some of the data. We could be getting better data, but, you know, it just needs to be looked at. There's also vendor-specific overlay protocols. So in the context of privacy issues, Apple Continuity, which runs over BLE advertisement manufacturer-specific data, this is a thing where people have already reverse-engineered this protocol. We just need to, like, actually put that into our tooling to say, oh, yeah, I saw an Apple Continuity packet that's definitely you know an apple watch for instance but to me the really promising thing in this space is that there is this one paper where they essentially sent a whole bunch of different packet types in order to explore and recreate a finite state machine of the particular behavior of a particular firmware now their packet types and sequences were very limited in that they were mostly just normal, correctly behaving things like connecting and pairing to a device, doing key exchange, and that kind of thing. So I think that one, by adding a whole bunch of other packet types that they don't even consider, and two, by recreating the work and then being able to take two finite state machines from two different devices and diff it, essentially diff the graphs, then you will be able to start saying, what is the minimum number of packets that you can use to differentiate you know, Broadcom chip one versus Broadcom chip two. They may share a lot of behavior, but they may have some of these weird packets that they differ on. And you want to just generate a large state machine and then cut it down to only the diffs. And to me, when I talk about, you know, how I haven't, you know, done rigorous analysis of my multiple combinations of link layer packets, it's partially just because I really want to, you know, look at recreating this work. I just don't have the time because, again, this is 25%. And by the way, did I mention that the Bluetooth system is architecturally insecurable? No? Okay, well, let me justify that assertion. Previous to looking at Bluetooth, my specialty area was UEFI and BIOSes. So published a whole bunch of stuff on this back in 2013, 14, 15. Now, in the context of UEFI, we are still today seeing all the same problems that we saw a decade ago. So what does the UEFI ecosystem look like? Well, we have these pyramids like this, and the UEFI forum is essentially the special interests group. These are the silicon makers, Intel, AMD, and Qualcomm. UEFI is mostly used in PCs, but there is some utilization in phones. So we've got SIG Silicon, we've got intermediaries. These are what are called independent BIOS vendors in the context of BIOS. And then we have the device makers, the Dell, HP, Asus, Lenovo, and Acer's of the world. So, you know, not Apple, for instance, as well. So this is what the ecosystem looks like. It's a little bit bigger than this, but it's not that much bigger than this. 
And this ecosystem coming down from UEFI Forum has not been able to push down security successfully to get people to implement things as simple as stack canaries. So if that's an ecosystem that has had massive firmware problems and massive issues solving them, what does Bluetooth look like? Bluetooth has a SIG, a special interest group at the top, and then it's got 20 plus silicon vendors, Broadcom, Qualcomm, Texas Instruments, Silicon Labs, buying people like Blue, Blue Giga, Qualcomm buying people like CSR, Infineon buying people like Cypress, NXP, variety of Chinese companies that you may have never heard of. There's a ton of different silicon makers. So instead of like three for UEFI, we've got 20 now. Then we've got a whole bunch of module makers, and I have literally no idea how many of these things exist. I frequently find them when I'm just like, you know, randomly Googling things like, what is Partron OUI? What is BNCOM? And I find out, oh, these are like Korean specific module makers. And so you only ever see them with like Korean products in, you know, the Korean market. So you may never literally ever see them in like the US, but then you they pop up over in Korea. What stuff is gonna pop up only in China? What stuff's gonna pop up only in Russia? I don't know. And I have literally no idea how to find all of these things. So these are the intermediaries. So instead of just the handful of independent BIOS vendors, we've got all these module makers using who knows which different chips. And then finally, there are the product makers. And like I said, there's over 3000. I'm sure it's probably closer to 3500 at the time that I'm actually speaking this rather than writing it. And if we can't secure ecosystems with like one, three, you know, five, and then 10, how are we going to solve this? So I think we need to abandon hope for security, all who enter here. But this is what I find so compelling and interesting about Bluetooth research. I found UEFI interesting because it was extremely powerful and it could take complete control of the system. This is going to be extremely interesting because it just kind of is everywhere. Any, you know, common place you go with a lot of people, you will easily see like a thousand devices within a minute. So just, you know, open up one of those phone scanners, go to the airport, go to the mall. You will easily see a thousand individual devices. Now it's not going to be a thousand unique devices. You know, there's a lot of iPhones, there's a lot of Samsung devices, but there's just a bazillion of them out there. I mean, they quote things saying how many billion Bluetooth devices have been shipped and it's in the tens of billions. This is not like, you know, phones, like Windows, you know, brags about, you know, their billion devices. Apple brags about their two billion devices. Bluetooth is in the tens of billions. And this is an ecosystem that is not set up for easy or quick updates. So this is going to be a gigantic problem that's going to be with us for a long time. So I find it interesting and that's why I think there should be more people checking it out. And that's all the stuff I've got to say about tooth printing for now. So again, check out the uh, code and look for the future classes on Bluetooth from Open Security Training. Thanks for watching this very long video.